I uh, enjoy this kind of thing, and uh, I hope that I, you can walk away with a little golden nugget or two or three. And uh, I've been in the business 40 and a half years. I didn't know where to start this. So I thought, well, you know, there's a hundred different ways that I could you know, start this little presentation. I thought, well, got to start somewhere, right? So this is my office door, this first picture that you see. Bought a little uh, plumbing shop, what used to be a plumbing shop, and uh, converted it to my little rental business. Had my stoves and refrigerators in the back room and my leftover siding and windows and, and tools and all that. And um, so I, my first 20, I've been in business 40 years, right, 1977. You can see on the door there. The first 20 years I ran my business out of my hip pocket and off the uh, dash of my pickup, okay? <laughs> and these last 20 years, uh, I've been in this little office on, uh, on 8th Avenue, just a little, little place about eight blocks east of the courthouse and about a block south up in the little town of Marshalltown. And uh, whoa, we're getting better effects here with uh, the lights. Um, I promise after this I'm going to go with PowerPoint. Um, I always, I taught years and years ago, back in the last century, right? <laughs> and uh, I've got so used to using this uh, opaque projector, overhead projector, and I saw it's so comfortable, and I saw this in a magazine, and I thought, I gotta have that. But uh, I guess it's a, it's a dinosaur, even though they still make them new. Uh, I was having trouble with focus yesterday, I called and I got somebody in Taiwan. He spoke pretty good English. But uh, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with the focus. I think we got it figured out, but it's still not quite as good as PowerPoint, so I'm definitely going to go. <laughs> if you ever see me speak again, I promise you I'm going to have a PowerPoint for you. Okay. So anyway, uh, and you can uh, ask me a question. I'm just going to go 40 minutes today. I think I went an hour yesterday, had a different topic yesterday. So this is a scavenger way to shacks on a shoestring. Okay. Um, I've got four books. I've, I created the uh, series Scavenger Way. My parents were scavengers, dump pickers, and I'll tell you about that in a little while. I've got two published, and I am on Amazon, but I did bring a box today with about 10 each. So uh, if you'd like to have a book when I get done, I'll personally sign that baby for you, right? <laughs> and so uh, you can find me on Amazon, uh, a couple, three videos on Amazon. I'll just hold up a couple. The first one is Scavenger Way to Wealth, and a few of you, one or two or three of you have bought this book. I see a, a few faces here I recognize and a few more that I don't, but anyway. And I published that uh, five and a half years ago. And then uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, I published Scavenger Way to Real Estate Riches. And the other two are Scavenger Way to Multifamily Miracles that I talked about yesterday. And Scavenger Way to Shacks on a Shoestring is what I'm going to talk about today. Okay. So uh, why did I choose that title? Because I started buying bulldozable shacks. And... Um, they were uh, properties that other people passed on. But I found some value, and I think because of the five years <clears throat> that my dad uh, went unemployed, he had, uh, he had uh, his lungs had filled up with stone dust. Nobody wore a mask back in the 50s. He worked in a little stone mill. And so all he knew how to do, we had an old pickup, and we went from city dump to county dump to private dump. And back at that time, there were no landfills with tall fences and locking gates like there are now. Everything was wide open. You just drove up and threw off your garbage, your trash, whatever, and you walked around and picked up somebody else's if you wanted to. And that's how we survived. We picked up, uh, uh, we picked up metals that we could recycle, brass and copper and zinc and aluminum. There were car batteries. There, was, there were lead, lead pipe. You know, if you're in your, uh, in your kitchen and you have your sink there, and then you open the doors down below of the cabinet and you see the, the trap there. Well, when I was a little boy, those were all of solid lead. And then in the 60s, that was 50s. 60s come along and they were in brass. They were in brass about 20 years and 80s and 90s came along and now up to today and they're all in PVC. So when people were converting, they'd just take those brass traps out and just, you know, people threw, we didn't have any Composting back then, most of you know that. We didn't have, we didn't, uh, we didn't have recycling of any kind. But, uh, so, so my dad trained us uh, with radar vision to go around and pick up aluminum and lead and brass and copper and copper wire and all these things and uh, brought them back to the pickup where he was waiting because he couldn't walk around because he was always out of breath. He had severe asthma. And um, <clears throat> that's how we survived <clears throat> excuse me, for five years. And finally, my dad qualified for Social Security disability. And uh, then, 
then uh, we could uh, eat a little bit better. We didn't have to butcher goats, and uh, although we continued butchering goats for a while, and uh, run throw lines out of the Iowa River, or trot lines, as they say down south. Does anybody, everybody know what a trot line or a throw line is? Take a big, long line and put about 30 hooks on it, put a rock on the end of it, and, and whirl that thing out to the middle of the river. It had, it'd have to go down, otherwise it'd float on top of the river, and then other people in the area would see that something was going on, right? Particularly a game warden. We never wanted the game warden to catch us. <laughs> we never got caught by the game warden. All those things we did illegal, we never got caught. But it was to feed our family. It wasn't, you know, we weren't causing any problem for anybody else. So we never got caught. So that was a good thing. Um, Hand-me-downs and uh, goats and chickens and uh, a few uh, rabbits and whatnot that we could trap or we could we could shoot. And uh, for five years, and finally we. Uh, my dad got a, a social security check, a disability from social security, moved into town, and we had running, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we had running water for the first time. We had a toilet, um, <coughs> an indoor toilet for the very first time, um, and a bathtub. Uh, we had, um, it, was, <laughs> it was a dinosaur, but it, <laughs> it had a few modern things that every other place we had did not have. So we were, we were up and going at that time. I was in about fifth grade. Anyway, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit. So this is, uh, like I said, the first uh, tw uh, 20 years, uh, I ran the business off my uh, dash, my pickup, and out of my hip pocket. And uh, are you bringing me that? I'm so dry today. Thank you very much. I, don't know, I, got, I have cotton mouth. I don't know what it is. It must have been that sip of coffee I had out there in the hallway. Oh, that's a whole lot better. Thank you very much. And so, um, and so the last 20 years, I've, I've run a little more civilized type of business. And then uh, show a little bit of credibility. I'm not going to spend much time on credibility, just a tiny little bit. Um, this was in my first book I published five and a half years ago, Scavenger Way to Wealth. And that's in my office. And um, uh, somebody said, uh, and I didn't really have it planned, but somebody said, well, stand over there. And I can't even remember who the person was that took that and sent it to me. And uh, I want to get a picture of you standing there by those houses. And I said, okay. And didn't realize that a year or two later I was going to use it in my first book. And so my first 50 possessions. Now, I bought, started buying um, multifamily the second year. One year later, 1978, I bought a threeplex and quickly converted it to a fiveplex. And if you have five units or more, you have multifamily. If you have four units or less, then that's not considered multifamily. But anyways, I'm going to uh, talk mostly about uh, I talked about, about multifamily yesterday, if you were here, a few of you were here. And so today it's just going to be the individual places and uh, how to build income, uh, how to take advantage of situations. And uh, so I hope I can help some of you. Before uh, I get to that, just I uh, want to show you one picture. This kind of says it all. And I won't spend much time on this, but I want to, and, uh, let's see if I can get this. There we go. And almost have it. Uh, there we go. So my mom is bending down, and my sister is on the left there. My oldest sister. We were. Uh, uh, I'm the fifth born out in, and uh, the fifth born in six years. And I'm the little guy there in the middle with the blonde hair. And then, I was born in 1950, and this was taken in 1954. And I remember the day it was taken. By the way, and we're all squinting because the sun was going down, and and we're looking right into the sun. And uh, we lived in it. This was a, this was a <laughs> converted railroad car. And uh, what you see there is the, uh, you can see the tar paper, barely. But it was, a, it was a, nothing more than a windbreak. And we burnt coal and wood. didn't have modern conveniences in any way, shape, or form. But uh, it was a converted, it was a caboose. And the one side had a, had a uh, uh, was a living room, had a pot belly stove. And the middle was the caboose where we slept. And then the back was another lean-to and had a dining room table, had a wood cook stove, and uh, had some uh, cabinets in there, just shelves nailed to the wall. That was our kitchen. And um, didn't have running water. We had, a, a, we had a, a, a pump out back where we pumped our own water. So that, uh, that tells you uh, a little bit about my start. I was going to talk just a little bit about my why. And uh, up until a few years ago, I never heard anybody mention, you know, what is your why? Where did you, how do you know that this idea is your why? What propels you to go toward the future? Why do you want to stay in investing? Why aren't you doing something else? And uh, you have to decide that. So 
<clears throat> I was going to share a little bit about you with my why, my why, and I've already done that. I'm just going to take another moment or so um, and tell you that uh, despite the poverty, had some personal problems, uh, had uh, uh, I had dyslexia very bad. Uh, I was colorblind. I'm still colorblind. <laughs> um, so the teasing and the very bad feelings that you get when you're growing up, and um, sometimes there's someone teasing you. Sometimes it's it's feelings that you have within yourself you, you can't read. And uh, I was luckily able to overcome that. It took a long time. It seemed like it took forever, but it. Uh, looking back on it, it was just a few short years, but those short years seemed like an eternity. Uh, so I finally did learn how to read and was able to go to college, was able to go to graduate school, and um, the rest is history, I guess. But um, <clears throat> we didn't have any money, we didn't have anything of value, and um, we felt like that we had suffered. And uh, because of that, I had to remind myself when I was beginning to invest, and I still remind myself of where I came from uh, and why I'm doing it, because I, I don't want to lapse back into that era. Uh, and if you, uh, there's been surveys done of, of, of millionaires, and almost always their response is the reason why they stay going is because they're afraid of going into, they're afraid of lapsing into bankruptcy. So they, they, they keep on working, they keep on going. Their biggest, their number one fear is falling into bankruptcy. So with that, with that in their head and with, with them reminding themselves of that thought all the time, that is their thrust to stay going. Okay, so what is your thrust to stay going? You have, to, you have to know what it is or else you're just swimming in mediocrity like somebody with a blindfold on. You need to, every day you wake up, every day you go to bed, two, three, four times a day, you're driving along, you're pouring yourself coffee or whatever, you need to think about what you're, what's driving you and, it, and if it's worth it. And if it is, continue to define for yourself those things that, that keep you going. And uh, so with that, I was just going to get into, uh, like I said, <laughs> Maybe I haven't given you any gold nuggets yet, but I promise I'm going to give you some gold nuggets here, okay? And uh, anyone has a question, don't be afraid to raise your hand because I'll be very happy to answer for you. And uh, I'm not going so very long today. I've only got 24 minutes left. <laughs> I come with about, uh, I don't know, five hours of material and, and try to reduce it down to just a few minutes. But uh, we'll see how we get along here. And uh, like I said, I'll take a question from anybody at any time. Uh, just little things that got me going. Uh, learning how to add and subtract, believe it or not, sounds like a very a simplistic idea, but you know, running the numbers in my head, asking myself, you know, is it worth it if I pay this much, and is there going to be this much rent left over, and how much are going to be the expenses, and, and how do I know? I better go ask somebody. Network with people in plumbing shops and in coffee shops and in, uh, get out there and, and the lumber yards. It used to be lumber yards when I was a kid. Now they've pretty well gone away, but we have Lowe's and we have Menards. And uh, we have Home Depot and some of those. And uh, you, you, go in and you go in and out at any degree of regularity. You'll see the same faces. You'll get acquainted. That's what you need to do. Get acquainted because there's always somebody that knows something that you don't. And, and if that person doesn't, can't answer your question, he knows somebody that can answer your question. Or that guy knows somebody who knows somebody. And some people very freely. You know, we feel the best excuse me, about ourselves when we, we know that we are helping somebody else in need. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, think about that for a moment. So do you have to pay for networking? Absolutely not. Oh, it's, it's kind of neat to, you know, you pay a few bucks and you come to a seminar like this. And uh, you can do that a little bit. Maybe fly across cross country now and then. Pat yourself on the back a little bit if you had a little bit, a little bit of success. But by and large, the networking doesn't cost you anything. If you're paying tons of bucks to sit down with somebody to teach you something, I would say, you're not going down the right path. And so always look for the opportunity to, to ask questions. And in the beginning, I had to ask a lot of questions. I didn't have any money. And uh, I'd do everything I could myself. And when I ran out of knowledge, I'd run and ask somebody in a plumbing shop or wherever to tell me how they did it. And you know, I'd memorize what they said. Or maybe I'd make a couple little notes or something. I'd run back to my work, my, where I was working and uh, apply what I could and maybe get that person's number and call them back and, and that's, that's, that's how you have to do it, I think. Uh, being organized, the, the, uh, Mr. Landlord was here the other day and he talked about the importance of being organized. And uh, in the early days, I had, 
I would you know, write down carpenters, electricians, plumbers, flooring installers, and try to uh, categorize and classify those people. So right when I needed somebody to change a water heater for me, or I, needed, I had a roof leak, I had this or I had that, I could just go to my system and pull out my paper and look down there where, it's, where I could find the carpenter or, or, or uh, roofer, whatever I wanted. And it really, really, you know, and it takes time. You're driving along and you see a, a, a truck go by and it says Joe's Electrical or whatever. Pull over and, and, and stop dead in your tracks and, and write that number down because when else, if you, if you let it go for 10 minutes or something, you might not remember it. So, so you know, there's no, there's no easy way. But once you get the system, oh, it's so nice. All you have to do is update just every now and then. Maybe somebody moves to California, maybe somebody passes away, whatever. Yeah, you got to update a little bit once in a while. But have a system. And wow, that system talks to you and you talk to it. And things are much better. Yeah, and there are growing pains in developing it. Absolutely. So just very quick, I ran across this the other day. I thought, well, I don't, what am I going to tell? What am I going to talk about in this seminar? I got so many things in my head. I don't even know where to start. But anyway, so this I pulled this out of the out of the archives. Oh, I better turn that around. Turn that out. Of, I pulled that out of, and just notes I made to myself. So let's see here. So we got uh, somebody here knows something about computers, right? And uh, here's somebody that that works uh, maintenance, and here's somebody that knows how to put on siding. And here's somebody that does appraisals. Why do I want to talk to anybody that does appraisals? He might know where there's an empty property. He might know if there's one going up for sale. He might know if there's one in bankruptcy. He might know the value of the property that I want to buy. Huh? Don't limit yourself. Don't, don't limit yourself. Always look for ways to increase your knowledge. Um, I can't read my own writing. What does that say? Yeah. Whatever that was. Uh, South Sixth Street Auto I used to give this guy 200 bucks under the table. I'd go get a pickup or an old car. And I'd stand right there at uh, auctions that were closed to the public, only, only open to the dealers. And he'd uh, tell them that I was his driver or his mechanic or whatever. And I'd stand right there in line, buy my own cars. And hey, have you ever been to a dealer's auction? You can get a, a $10,000 car for uh, somewhere between uh, 3500 and 5500 usually. It's a huge advantage, a, a gigantic advantage if you're needing a second-hand vehicle. Don't ever go to a lot. No, no, no. And I'm still, we, we come down here in a 2008 um, Azera Hyundai, and I got that at an auction and, uh, just a few months ago. And I got a brand-new car. Yeah, I got a brand-new car. Well, I run up high miles on that. We live in Marshalltown. It's about 55 miles down here and 55 miles back. And it runs better interior than my brand new car. It floats along. It runs better than my brand new car. So anyway, um, and it, you know, I could have a Cadillac. I could have a Rolls Royce. But why do that? Why uh, I'm just as happy with an ordinary car. Anyway, so so I just want to show you that I did all this and that, and then so then I thought, well, I had a, I got a secretary ten years ago. I never had any. Never first thirty years, I didn't have anybody help me with anything. I did everything myself. So I said one day, well, you got a little bit of time? Well, yeah. Now I can find what I was going to show you. And uh, I said, well, can you type out some of my notes for me? She said, she said sure. So, you know, I'm not very techy. Maybe probably the whole world is more techy, or is more techy than I am, OK? I don't care. I don't let that bother me. Don't let things bother you. Find something that you know that you can do. And if you can't, if you can't do it, find something that somebody can help you with. They're not going to make fun of you. If they are, they're not a very good human. <clears throat> They're not a very good human being. You don't want to associate with those people anyway. Is that right? So, <laughs> so here we go. So we got Tom Davis. He knows something about drains. And just I'm going to, just a minute or so. I, like I said, I've got so much and I can't get to everything. But I'm just kind of picking. I'm hitting and missing here and hoping I can uh, I'll, I'll let you pick out a couple of golden nuggets here, okay? And so this guy's still in business. Some of this, some of this is 10, 12, 14, 16 years old. Uh, but I'm just showing you, you know, I'm just, uh, it's, it's, it's worth something. There's uh, Roger, he still works for me. The electrician, heating and cooling, we got roofing, we got an inspector, we have flooring, carpet, carpet store guy, Sherwin Williams. What's Sherwin Williams? What's that? It's a paint store. It's nationwide. It's, it's more than nationwide. It's international. I've seen them and been over to London. I've seen them over there. Went in a store in Scotland, Sherwin Williams, and I asked about wallpaper. And uh, what did he call that? Can't think of the name of it now. He said, now, there's different price ranges here. And I said, yeah. Yes, now, he said, over here, these are the least dear. And over here, these are a little more dear. And over here at this end, these are a lot more dear. 
And I thought, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, more, least expensive, not so expensive, not so, uh, okay. Or I mean, middle price and then very dear is more expensive, right? <laughs> so it's, we all speak English, don't we? I mean, it's a little different slant over that way. <laughs> so anyway, so there you go. So, uh, but uh, main point here is to be organized. Now, I'm not going to show you everything that I have earned, but I'm going to show you one thing. And I'm not looking for anybody to applaud. Just, uh, just chipping away at it. Starting with a bulldozable shack. Paid $6,000 for it uh, 40 and a half years ago. And didn't really know what I was doing, but I had a, a boss. I was working for a contract painter. And he always said, you know, get, uh, he'd start by a few real estate, a few places, a uh, few houses to rent out. And he said, you know, real estate rarely goes down and, and it sometimes stays, you know, the price stays steady. Might, might not go up very much, but it almost always goes up. And if you sit on it a while, it's always going to go up. That's your best bet. So that idea stuck with me and uh, worked my way up to, uh, these, are my, this is my, these are my assets here. I just... Uh, thought that I would show you a little bit. I'm up to just a few pennies under 25 million in assets. And uh, never thought that I, what, what was my first goal when I first started? To have one house. That first year that I was in this, just to have one house and work on a little bit, fix up a little bit. That was my only goal. I couldn't see any further than beyond my nose. Yeah. And uh, my brain was probably the size of a pea, if not smaller. And then it grew to the size of a walnut when I bought a couple other houses, right? And now it might be the size of a bushel basket, I don't know. <laughs> but I have to remind myself every day to, to you know, take it one step at a time and be grateful and be thankful for everything I have. This is a very short life we have. You know, we're young and we, we think that time isn't going fast enough. And it isn't very long and we're in our 30s and 40s and it still doesn't occur to us. And we get into our 50s and 60s and think, yeah, this, this life isn't forever. And you get to be my age, I'm a few days away from my 67th birthday and you think, well... Some days I wake up and I feel like, man, I'm going to, can I live forever? I can't live forever. Boy, I do feel good. Maybe the very next day I wake up and I think, my God, is this, is this it? Is this going to be it? Is it going to be today? Yeah, yeah. How many of you are in your 60s here or 70s? One, two, three, four. Yeah. So, you know, you guys, you younger, you're in your 60s or more. Oh, you did? <laughs> I didn't see you. <laughs> I, I <laughs> so anyway, so so here we go. So anyway, just to kind of show a little bit of they say uh, bring a credibility kit. I never really knew what that was. I kind of need to know what that is because the uh, Mr. Landlord uh, was here the night and asked me to be on his speaking circuit. So I better you know don't I still got a long ways to go, but maybe I'll figure out what a, a, a can. Um, what did I just say? <laughs> credibility kit. Thank you. Maybe I'm going to have to figure out what a credibility kit is and, and, uh, and focus on that a little bit when I hit the big time. I haven't hit the big time yet. But maybe, I'll, maybe I will, maybe I won't. I've got, a lot <laughs> I got kids and grandkids, and I've got one daughter halfway around the world, and i got lots of things in my head. So. so anyway, so we haven't done. Let me just show you. Let me just pull some ideas out. Uh, I've got a lot of good ideas. But uh, I was just talking to uh, this guy's brother. You're, you're not Ben. Where's Ben today? Oh, you are Ben. Well, you, well you're, you look like you're, you, he looks, he's slumping. He looks smaller. And uh, I told him last night, I'm going to give you a, a tip, a golden nugget. And as you go out and work for people, always try to work, not by the hour, but by a contract. If you're mowing somebody's grass and you think, well, that's going to take three hours, and the guy talking to you, well, you kid your age, you don't really deserve any more than 10 or 12 an hour, so that's uh, 30 to 36 bucks maximum. No, don't get talked into that. When I was 15, I had 22 yards in a little town of Union. And I always mowed by contract. I never mowed by the hour. And that really helped me. And anything you do, and I've got three prime examples of putting the down payment together. In this one book of mine, I wrote a couple of years ago, Scavenger Way to Real Estate Riches. I have the first 23 pages is the first chapter, and it might be the most important, although there are many. <laughs> I really like all my chapters in there. But it's all on the how to find down payment money. And uh, always work by contract. If you're uh, power washing somebody's siding or their deck or whatever, go by contract. 
So you can do it in two or three hours, $100 bill, minimum, minimum. Hey, you got to pick up, your time's worth something. Your, your credibility, your, your knowledge is worth something. Uh, $100 bill. So what if it takes an hour and a half? The guy agrees to it, you do him a good job, he's not going to come back to you and say, you know, you kind of got done here a little bit too quick, but I guess I did agree, so here's your $100. He's going to always pay you. And one person out of 100 might try to bat you down. But uh, not that you're robbing anybody, but your time is worth something. Don't work by the hour. Never, never, never work by the hour. That's a golden nugget. Huh? Never work by the hour. Uh, whether you're fixing computers, I have a list of about 20 or 30 things that you can do with your mind. I was more physical, right, and less mental. <laughs> uh, and so I'm the guy that wanted to paint and wanted to do the power washing. So I got a few examples here. And uh, another thing I have, I, I talk about in my book is seal coating. Let's see here. Yes. And this guy was doing my neighbor's house last year, and uh, he charged uh, $450 plus the cost. He used about six of these five-gallon buckets. And you, all you do, go to Menards, there's three different classes of this stuff. There's the real cheapy stuff for 12 bucks a bucket, something like that. These were last year's prices. I think that was two years ago. And then there's like, uh, I don't know, 18 dollars a bucket, and then there's like 26 or 20, 28 dollars a bucket. Buy the most expensive, it'll stay looking nice for two, three, four years, depending on how much traffic it has and that. You just need a squeegee, you know, like the window washer has a squeegee, it's the same thing, just the one strip of hard plastic on a pole, it's all you need, and you need a bucket, you're in business. Go around, knock at a door, hey, I'm, I'm a seal coater, I can make your property, do one for free and let them pay for the uh, materials and then take before and after pictures. Have big, big 10 by 12 pictures in your hand. Knock, ring the doorbell. I do this. Uh, and I normally charge so many dollars, but uh, you know, this looks like a fairly, I can do this uh, and I can do you a good job and I'll charge you so many dollars. If you say yes today, I can give you a 33% discount or whatever. And you know, you build, build that in. Are you, are you cheating anybody? Are you, are you a scoundrel? No, it's persuasive, persua persuasive sales talk. Everybody uses persuasive sales, maybe, maybe in a dime store where things are 19 cents or 79 cents or whatever. Yeah, you're not gonna have any negotiation there. But everybody uses pers persuasive sales talk in almost all industries and in almost all places around the world. So, uh, so there you go. This guy got this thing done start to finish in about two and a half hours, put $450 in his pocket. Uh, right next door to me. I'm not exaggerating. If you would have gone by the hour at 12 or 14 or 16 an hour, how many dollars would you have? Uh, you would have chicken feed. You would have something not even mentionable. Always contract. Look for a way to contract. Tell your kids. Tell your grandkids. Anybody got great grandkids? No. <laughs> uh, I, I'm probably only uh, eight or nine years away from great grandkids, by the way. <laughs> Anyhow. Any questions? That's one. I got a couple more examples to give you. I'm going to go lots and lots and lots. I guess I'm not talking fast enough. Oh my God, I only have eight minutes left. Can you believe that? Hey, is that all the time I get? Ah, that ain't enough time. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I'm trying to give you some old nuggets here. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, here, so here is yours truly, and I refreshed 48 years. My house is 48 years old, and I refreshed the concrete. I went into uh, to Sherwin Williams one day, and you can count yourself, you can mix. Uh, power, power washing, you can mix painting, you can mix refreshing concrete, you can mix seal coating, those you can make money like, a, like robbing a bank. You can make money almost as quick as putting a pistol in somebody's face and say, give me all the cash in your wallet. I just gave you an example of it, I'm not exaggerating. Huh? You need to, if you want to get involved in real estate, you need down payment money, your first one or two places you buy, you need to figure out how to get your hands on down payment money. After that, you, you work with, uh, with your bankers and they cross collateralize your loans. I never even heard that term until about six, seven years ago. I couldn't even pronounce it when I first heard it. Cross collateralization of loans. What's collateral? Collateral value and equity all mean the same thing. Collateral value equity, okay? When you build up some equity, you go to your banker, Say, I got these three little shacks here, they're producing so much rent, and uh, I think they're worth so many dollars. I want to pull out some equity. I want to buy this 12-plex or 15-plex. And I've done it many, many times, just signing my name. It just took my signature. Yes, 
many, many times your equity continues to self-perpetuate. You don't have to get out there and do seal coating jobs. Even you might fall in love with some of these jobs. I'm still in love with painting. And I started when I was 16 years old with a painter. I'm still in love with it. People say, well, you've got all kinds of money, Steve. Why are you, why are you going to go paint that? It relaxes me. It makes me feel good. Huh? I can see my progress immediately. It makes me feel good to know that I can see my progress immediately. I can't do that with some of the people that I talk to. Huh? <laughs> but I can always do that when I'm painting. So anyway, uh, so those are four ideas for you right there to go out and, like I said, I'm on the physical side. If you're more toward uh, technology, if you're an IT person, you can go repair a screwdriver, knock at somebody's door, or run some ads on, Craig, on Craigslist. It's free advertising. Hey, free, you know what you can do with uh, free advertising? You can do anything imaginable with free, adver free advertising. Show up to, uh, with a door with a screwdriver in your hand. I'm here to repair your computer. I can't, I, I can't repair anybody's computer. I barely find the on-off switch. But, 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 uh, but I'm oriented toward the physical stuff, huh? Physical. I'm physical. Yeah. So anyway, I've given you many, many examples of both of those in my, in my first chapter. No, not, let's see. Uh, yes, in my first chapter, uh, scavenging the down payment. Yes. All right, any questions? I've got very, very short time. I've got home. <laughs> Can I come back sometime? <laughs> I know you want to get out of here too, so we're trying to, I'm trying to hurry this up. I normally would use 90 minutes on something like this. Um, here we go again. This is a guy that worked for me until a few years ago. Well, no, until earlier this year. And a guy from Mexico. And uh, I lived in South America and became uh, sp fluent in Spanish. And uh, some of these guys just kind of come toward me. And some of them are pretty good workers. And try to hire them if I can and keep my language skills alive. But uh, this guy's name is Rigo. And... Uh, so he is, this is my house actually, and getting ready for a party a few months ago. And uh, so he has a power washer, and he is washing my siding. Can you barely see the difference there? You see the discoloration? Some of these siding, oh, what's wrong? I try to buy the best siding in the world, and certain houses will draw mold. And I still don't have that figured out. I don't know what it is. But he found some kind of soap that says that uh, it'll stay, keep it off for at least two years. And uh, it's, you know, nowadays things are written in English and in Spanish. And he found this and showed it to me. I said, well, let's go for it, you know. And so we'll see. That's only been about four months, so <laughs> we'll see if it lasts two years. But that's phenomenal. You drive around town, you see all this mold growing on, basically on the north side of a house. But this is on the west side right here. That's the west side of my house. I'm thinking, I, I spent a lot of money for that siding. It wasn't that long ago. What's wrong with my siding? <laughs> anyway, so you've got seal coating, you've got painting, you've got power washing, and uh, as ways to contract painting as ways to, to make some money in real estate. Let me see here. I've got, uh, I need to pick and choose very, very carefully here. Uh, I was going to uh, uh, talk about forced appreciation. Excuse me for a minute. Forced appreciation. Now I call, I have a chapter in my book called Scavenging the Appreciation, okay? Scavenging the Appreciation, that's in chapter about seven, I think. And the true definition is forced appreciation. Now here it is, here is a house, and I'm gonna show you a picture of this house, and I bought it about 20 years ago, and, and scavenging the purchase, that's also a, a, a chapter in my book, and uh, I checked with the realtors, and finally found this house, okay, after checking, checking, checking. And uh, they said, well, they wanted, uh, they'd started at 30 or something, they've reduced it down to 19.5, and I thought, no, that needs, that needs some work, it's a little rough, it's not so very modern, and, and the realtor called and said, would you give, uh, would you, could you give uh, like 14,000? And I said, well, you need to let me think about that. I, I just don't, I, I'm, I'm just not quite prepared to buy right now. And I got some other bills that came up. And, and you can use this to sort of stall people too, because don't, you don't want to always jump at the first opportunity. And so she called back a couple days later and she said, Steve, I'm good. <laughs> She said, I'm going to be squarely honest with you. She said, this lady is dying of cancer and doesn't have any more than a couple of weeks to live. And uh, if, if you could pay $9,500, she said, uh, that would pay her some bills that she had. She had there, I don't know if it was a nursing home or whatever, and to take care of uh, the, the transaction of the house. Not, not too much legal work that would have to be done on you know, the, bringing the abstract up to date and that kind of thing. And, uh, he said, we'd let you have that for 9,500. So, so uh, you know, I've heard, I've been to seminars where they say, don't go to realtors. Why not? 
Why not? They, they can ask somebody. They can come back and ask somebody a second time, ask somebody a third time, ask somebody a fourth time. Uh, what have you got to lose? I mean, unless you've got tons of other really good deals staring in the face, what's wrong with working with realtors? So that's why I got that. All right, now very quickly. So how did I use forced or what I call scavenge appreciation? This is actually the house. Oh, I've got too big of a scale here. So you can see, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. <laughs> I'm just going to stop there. We've got two bedrooms, and we've got uh, a kitchen, and we have a bathroom and a living room. Now, that space at the top there, right here, was an enclosed three-season porch. Okay, and over here, <laughs> there we go. That's the doorway going out of the laundry room here, back into that three-season porch. And over here... This here was a window, just like an old-fashioned house has a window going out, and then they build a three-season porch there. So, uh, <laughs> well, so anyway, so I, scab I, I used forced appreciation to bring that value up, to make it far more rentable, and to make it far more, far more saleable if I decide to sell it. Okay, so what I did was took that three-season porch, had a beautiful cement floor in it, put in insulated, put in some new windows, insulated, put, uh, put a, a ceiling in, sheet rocked. I scavenged the labor, went to the halfway house. You know what a halfway house is? They, they, people go to a halfway house before they turn them back out onto the street, these criminals. And a lot of this guy had, had uh, alcohol problems. He wasn't, hadn't you know, threatened anybody or anyone. He just had alcohol problem and uh, had to go to put in some time. And uh, his dad was a carpenter. And he helped me, I scavenged the labor. I only gave him like eight bucks an hour. This is going back a few years. Took this, split this right down the middle, and made two more bedrooms. I took out this window right here and created a doorway. So this doorway went into that bedroom, and this doorway stayed the same and had, went into this bedroom. And just like that, for just a couple, three, four thousand sheetrock insulation and scavenge labor, and I created, I put two more, I infused a ton of value into this little house I just picked up for $9,500. So that's, I have a whole chapter in my book on scavenging the appreciation. So there's another idea for you. And uh, wow, I have so much. To, <laughs> it says I have eight seconds left here. Uh, can we take a question or two before I hang it up? Okay. So uh, had a lot more to get to. You guys will look for me. Maybe I'll be in this area in the six months or a year. I don't know. And I really have a lot more I wanted to share with you. Yes. Oh, that one there. I had that ready to go as I had. You know what? Can I show that just for 30 seconds? Oh, have I? Okay. Well, this is a, uh, let, let me, all right, let, let me just take a minute. And I'll give, I'll throw one more idea at you. This is a house that I bought and, uh, whoa. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Wow. Well, we, well uh, you can see that it's ready, ready to be bulldozed, right? All right. So now, I, I, I'm going to raise this up because I can, there we go. All right, so this is what I transformed it into. Yeah, there we go. And uh, picked it up for 10, I sold it for 49.9. All right, now this very next question is this. And you guys will be scratching, if, and if you were in here yesterday, do not volunteer the answer. All right, and a couple of you were in here yesterday. <laughs> There we go, we're getting closer, there we have it. Okay, so this is the exact floor plan of this house that I just showed you. This will be my last point. And this is a very strong point, it's a golden nugget. You ready? Clear out those pockets because I want you to have room for one more golden nugget before you leave here. All right, all right. So this is a house, I flipped it for 49. I mostly don't flip, I just bought more money in, in retaining and reutilizing re 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 your Re self or re-perpetuating re your own ongoing equity or collateral, cross-collateralizing. Another golden nugget for you. All right, here's a golden nugget, and I'll let you go. This is exact floor plan. The exact floor plan of this house I just showed you. I wanted three, I wanted it to become a three-bedroom house. As the way it stood, there's a bedroom here. BR stands for bedroom. Another bedroom here. You can see the bath here. All right, here's the living room. This is the doorway coming in off the porch. And this is the kitchen, and that's the back porch there. This is the doorway here going out of the kitchen and into the back porch. 
Now, here's the question. How did I get, how did I make, how did I add a third bedroom to this house? How did I add a third bedroom to this house? Any ideas? Pardon? No, somebody said that yesterday. No, I didn't utilize the attic. I have a basement, full, full size basement in this house, even though it's not a big house. I did not use any of the basement. I did not use any of the attic. I did not use any of the back porch at all, and the front porch is all open. Now you're looking at me and you're thinking, this guy is totally nuts. You're looking at me thinking that, that I have to be the craziest person on earth, right? How did I create the third bedroom? And I guarantee it's just, as, it's a full-size bedroom. It's like 11 by 12, a full-size bedroom. All right, that guy has the answer right there. I had more people than this yesterday and nobody found the answer, nobody had the answer. I just put the bedroom right there where the kitchen is, and this wall right here, I just put the cabinets on the other side of the wall and put the, put the kitchen at the end of this living room. Just put the kitchen at the end of the living room across the same wall and use the same plumbing pipes. It was so quick and so easy, just as, almost as quick and easy as snapping your fingers. Just like that, I infused value. I created I created forced appreciation. You know how much more a three-bedroom house brings than a two-bedroom that's all brand new and like this? At least $7,500. It depends on where you are. It depends on your area. Just like that out of thin air, I created, appreci I created appreciation. Forced appreciation, I call it scavenge appreciation. That's why you need to buy my book, right? <laughs> uh, and I go into lots of detail on scavenged appreciation. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I could walk through all my chapters in my book. I've walked, walked you through about three of the 10 or 12 chapters, and I uh, hope you have a teeny-weeny golden nugget at least to put in your, uh, uh, pa uh, <laughs> to put in your pa uh, pants pocket today and take with you. And uh, I'll take a question or two if anybody has any questions. For 40, I paid 10 for it. I sold it for 49.9. Yeah, I sold it for 49.9. Yeah. And uh, I put into it. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. You know what? Um, uh, the numbers. Let's see here. No, that was for a different house, Andrew. I don't have the numbers for this house. Well, the eighty-six was the um, was the uh, no. That was still across town at a different house. Yeah, that was on North Fourteenth Street. And yeah, and this one here is when you came up and visited me that day and brought I brought a group with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got 8,600, but it's, it's a different house. It is, yeah, that's a different house. And uh, one more little teeny-weeny concept. I bought a lot of them for six, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. And one time a guy was selling a property, and uh, he said it's my mother-in-law's house. And I knew some just Hispanics in the area, and they would pay 10000 in a heartbeat for a house. And I, didn't, I wanted to eliminate all competition. And he said, you know, my mother-in-law, she really needs the 10000 I said... Uh, but he said, you know, you, you need to decide, and uh, he said, I've got other callers too, and I've got to call them back. And he said, as a matter of fact, I, I need to be calling them back right now. I said, I'll tell you what, it was such a, such a house, I'll, I'll show it to you right away in, in a second. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, you a $2,000 chip in cash. You make out that contract right now, put my name on it, and I will give you a tip. Is it illegal to give somebody a tip? Is it illegal for somebody to accept a tip? No. No. It would be illegal for him maybe to not report it as part of an income. But it's not illegal for me to offer up a tip or to give a tip. No, no. And that's how I got that house. So I paid 10000 to his mother-in-law, and I gave him $2,000 in cash. I wanted to eliminate all competition. Uh, this, was, uh, this was about two, uh, about two and a half years ago. Yeah. Oh, this one here was, uh, let's see, let's see, about, uh, about five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, also paid a finder's fee for another property. That's another thing. Offer up somebody a finder's fee. So you, if, you, if you say to them, hey, I have, uh, I buy houses. And if I, if I find what I want, I'll give you a thousand bucks. I'll give you two thousand bucks. I'll give you three thousand bucks if it's between such and such. And you'd be surprised. I offered this guy a thousand bucks. He found me a house just like that. And uh, so he said, uh, well, can, when can I have my money? When, when can I have my money? And I thought, hey, 
one more scavenging technique in this little head of mine here. I said, well, if I didn't explain myself, I'm very sorry. I said, I offer you that money, but I really want to give you that the day, the day, the day I flip it and the day it closes, you know. And, uh, oh, oh, he said. And then, uh, well, he said, I was kind of hoping I could. I said, I tell you what, I said, I can give you. I said, uh, I'll give you two-thirds that amount and pay you today. Or if you wait till after, after I get it flipped, get it fixed and flipped, and I give you the ten, I give you the whole thousand dollars. I knew he was always a day late, a dollar short. Oh, 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 yeah. Well, right, I'll take that money now. Yeah. Can you give that? Me, give me that check now. I said, Yes, I can. I said, Right now, I gave him. I gave him. That's why I got on here six hundred and sixty-seven dollars. Yep. I got the two thousand dollars here that I gave the the son-in-law, the lady that had the house that wanted to, wanted to sell it. So there's all these you know tips and tricks, scavenging techniques. I call them. That's another reason to buy my book. <laughs> And I am on Amazon.com. If you wake up tomorrow and you think, oh, gosh, I should have bought Steve's book today. I didn't. But I'll go on Amazon.com. All right. Go on Amazon.com. I'm on there. Okay.